Uh, what we're going to do is, uh, th this panel's on the future of trad jazz, and, and, my, and my emphasis in putting it together was that future and trad are kind of juxtaposed with each other in opposite dire directions, because it's traditional, yet we want to move ahead with it, okay? And so that's the, the question, the conundrum that I had in my head, and I figured we had people coming from everywhere um, to have a unique perspective on it, and uh, the audience as well. Um, We'll try and give you some time to um, add your comments and questions as well. Um, there's a little bit of method to this. What I'm going to try and do is, is we'll start uh, on this side because we're closest. And um, and you'll have, uh, I don't know, about five minutes to give your spiel on the subject. And then what I want to do is have the other panelists be able to comment on it. Okay, like, uh, And the idea is to piggyback on the idea. That brought to mind this. And something like that, and, and keep those at, at children maybe one minute comments. So uh, that's the method, and um, we'll start over here on this side with you, sir. Oh, the, 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 is this question and answer? The, the idea is where do you see trad jazz going forward? Okay, okay, okay. And to. Um, Glad you're starting. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, you is want this, me to, it, no, no. Is this question and answer, or do you want me to just give a dissertation? It, on my, it's my it's thoughts? it's a it's a uh, I think a three to five minute spiel. I call it. Okay, I can do that. This is okay. It's not too too political. Yeah, I, I don't think I'll need a mic in here. Um, as far as the future of jazz is concerned, I, I think we're fortunate already in one sense. Uh, tell me how many 1950s rock and roll jazz festivals that you know about. <laughs> I mean, that's music that's even more modern than what we're doing, and they're having a tough time just trying to, to get out, and I, and I grew up listening to rock and roll along with jazz, and they're having a tougher time than we are. Uh, we still have some audience, and I understand that we lose the audience every day, they're dying, but one thing I think that's helped us tremendously is by incorporating dancers into this. Uh, I hear some musicians who complain about dancers because it, they're trying to perform up there and the dancers are trying to outdo them and I'm going, you know, if you sell a badge and they want to come and hear the music and dance to it, you should embrace them. They're part of the festival and they're important because that's a lot of badge sales you wouldn't have. And when you look at the average number of young people who are in those dancers, that dancing group, uh, that's, that's a younger generation that's enjoying this music. So I think that's one aspect. Another aspect I think of helping the jazz festival is opening the door. When, when Tom Rigney and Flambeau first came on board, I really embraced them and I thought, you know, this is, this is a good idea. It's throwing a little slant on something that isn't trad jazz, it isn't uh, swing jazz, but it's opening the door to some other people. And I embraced that. And I can remember a few trad musicians would say, well, it's not trad, we shouldn't have them here. And I'm going, you know, Maybe you ought to really embrace these guys because they're going to save your jobs, they're going to save your butt. And I think that's been part of the thing that's helped to open up the festival. So I, uh, I've seen festivals here that have failed. I can tell you two of them that have failed, uh, not because of financial reasons, but because no one else wanted to pick up the job of being a festival director. Uh, I ran a festival in Clearwater for eight years and I can remember having somebody sniffing at my hind end the whole time I was there. And, that gets old after a while, and it's hard to find people who will take up the administrative efforts to run a festival. It, it's, it's a one-year process. When the, this festival's over, you're already starting on the next one if you really plan ahead. And that's what it takes. And I know Seaside, uh, still financially, sort of was surviving, but when, when uh, Ruth and, uh, and her partner, uh, they said, we've had enough. We want to step down. Our husbands are starting to complain. And when husbands complain, that's that's when they're done. It's it's over. And uh, so I I would say that I, I don't see the history or the trad festivals completely going down or dying. I think there's going to be people here that are still going to come. Youth bands are very important, and we should we should embrace the youth programs because not only does that bring young players into playing jazz. Now, they're not going to spend their life as a career playing jazz. That's a good way to go poverty stricken and end up on the corner. But and they they may get away from trad jazz and, and, and go proceed to a more modern aspect of jazz, and that's okay. You know they want to do what they do in their generation. But if you start them out on trad jazz and they start playing, they learn the roots, the basis of jazz, 
and so many teachers today, uh, they don't even consider that as part of jazz, which is sad. And youth programs in the school systems particularly invite those young players. And the next good thing about that is that when they show up at a festival, the next generation, which are your children, they show up as parents. So that gets them involved. So I, I think youth programs, we have to do more than pay lip service. We have to really, and the only way to do that is invite them to play. You can have little, you can form bands, you can have clinics, you can do all that stuff. But if they don't get a chance to perform and play it, what's the point? And that's why I think every musician has an obligation to take a young player under their wing and say, come on kid, get up here with us, let's play something. And once you got them and you hook them, you got them. And it's the way to do it. Uh, the Al brothers are a classic example of, of hooking a family into jazz. I mean, it's a monopoly. <laughs> so that would be my final point. Uh, there might be one other thing. Uh, at the Clearwater Jazz Festival, the current festival director thought it would be a great idea to uh, bring in some modern jazz players because she likes that more, I think, than, sort of, than traditional jazz. So she made an effort to bring in a couple of modern jazz bands that were playing really really way out there. And I remember she booked one room on a Saturday night, the big ballroom, and I, I walked in and looked around and I think there were four people in the room. And I think what I realized, which is we all do, is that there's no crossover. If, if you're into modern progressive jazz and you hear all those extensions and everything, uh, you consider trad as, as uh, it's, it's uh, circus music. They don't want any part of it. And same way for trad people. People that enjoy early jazz or swing and jazz, uh, as a rule, they don't migrate into more modern jazz. So I, I think that's not a good way to try to increase your membership in a festival. Uh, it's, there's just too much division there and you end up ticking off some people. So that's, that's my comments. <laughs> Any piggybacks? Any piggybacks? I think I'll just wait my turn. Bob said a lot of things that I could certainly build um, on the top. Okay. Yeah. Carl, you would be on the. Um, Actually, if I, I do have a one oh, comment, okay. if I may. Thank you. And I'll use this because I'm hoping to sing with my band later today and still have a voice. But I would just I would just add to something. Um, I think. Uh, Myself and maybe and maybe Adrian and some other New York musicians among us among our numbers are actually a good amount of musicians who who both who enjoy playing both modern jazz and trad and it's not always they're not always completely exclusive but but what I would say maybe as as an amendment like uh, to festival organizers is it's it's important to uh, Maybe if they're branching out, not to not to branch out too many steps away from what the center of their festival is. It's like I think, like as as a listener, you know, my, myself, like when I first listened to John Coltrane or something, and I grew up listening to mostly this type of trad jazz. I didn't understand it and didn't like it, and I had to first like listen to, let's say, like Miles Davis and Charlie Parker and some others until I was in a position to understand more of Coltrane's music and appreciate it. So it's like you can't, you need like stepping stones. So it, when, they're, when they're looking to branch out with different types of music, like I think Tom Rigney is a great example, or like branching out to gypsy jazz, or maybe Western swing, or just swing music, or big band music that is just kind of a step away and still accessible to the same audience is an important thing. Well, obviously, Bob covered a lot of the, the bases there. No, that's good. I mean, it means I have to talk less. Um, but, of course, we all want to see more young people coming to these things. It's very easy to identify the problem, but not so easy to, to, to make a solution because, obviously, adding the swing dance aspect, if you can get those folks coming, that's a good thing. But as, as far as trying to appeal to the younger generation in general, it's difficult because, I mean, I don't want to put this tag on anyone else but myself, but there is a nerdy aspect to this music. Yeah. I mean, I'm a nerd, I've, I've, I, I didn't want to admit it for many years, <laughs> but I'm a nerd and I'm an eccentric, and there's always going to be eccentric kids who are attracted to traditional jazz or 
you know, for different things. I've been involved in the rockabilly scene. There's always kids into that, but there's not so many interested in coming and being a part of the audience. So um, for those of you who, who have ideas about this, I, I, would, I would start thinking about how can you make this appealing to young people in general. I don't have an answer, but that, that's the problem that we're facing because, you know, the average kid is looking for something sort of rebellious and aggressive, and maybe I'm overgeneralizing, but that's the way it seems to me. So that, that's one of the difficulties that we're facing as far as getting a younger audience interested in these kind of events. Um, about the bands that, that you book, I mean, it must be very difficult to, to put a festival together and have a balanced program because obviously you need some things that, that appeal to a, a big audience and get a lot of people in the room, but I, I would imagine you also have to think about how you're representing jazz and the different forms of jazz, so I would say it would be good to, to be aware of the fact that you might want to present a real New Orleans band, a real Chicago sound and Dixieland band, so that new, when new people come to hear, they're, they're actually hearing a, a true example of that particular kind of jazz. I mean, of course, assuming that these kind of bands are out there and can be booked, but um, I don't know if I'm making sense, but hopefully I did. Right. Yeah, I, I believe they are. Okay. I feel sorry for you guys by the time it gets to you. <laughs> uh, so, well, I'm going to fix this mic. I'm originally from Australia and moved to New York 10 years ago. And so this music in Australia uh, was very niche. I was, I think I was 20 when I was on the scene and there were some great old, old musicians that I learned from, but uh, there's something that attracted me to it. My dad loved Louis Armstrong, so it's always been a very big part of my upbringing, my childhood, and then moved to New York 10 years ago. And uh, as Gordon said, I think, like Gordon, we're both interested in the full spectrum of the music. It was a Duke that said there's two types of music, good and bad. And I feel that with the spectrum of the history of jazz, you know, I love, I love it all. But there's a special place for traditional, uh, you know, in my heart from where I came from. But, but let me ask you this, what does traditional jazz mean to, to everybody here? Because that's a pretty broad enough term as it is, right? Traditional jazz, you know? For some people, that might be bebop. Is a traditional bebop. Some people, it might be Louis Armstrong. Some people, it might be Big Spiderbeck. Some people, it might be Duke Ellington. There's, there's such a wide variety of what that term even means. That's going to be a hard one to nail down. You know? For me, I think... Uh, I think, well, I, I'm, I'm the musical director of two festivals at the moment. I'm in uh, North Carolina Jazz Festival, which runs in February, and also Colorado Springs Jazz Party. They're jazz parties. So I've seen these festivals do well, and North Carolina is doing really well because they're very open to, uh, to getting new, pa new people and new faces, new musicians that aren't necessarily uh, you know, part of the community that they're used to. The festival's been running for many, many years. And I think uh, what I've found is that audiences are more open-minded than uh, the organizers often, often give them credit for. That people are more open to hearing new, new people and new styles, perhaps. You know, there's, um, they had a Brazilian night in North Carolina last year and they went down really well. And Brazilian is, is, is very far away from traditional jazz, but there's something really deep about that type of music too that's, that, that affected people and it's beautiful music. So, I think having, as, as you mentioned too, having perhaps a different aspect, you know, having slightly different flavors of, of jazz is a good way to, to bring people in. And I think if we're talking about keeping this music alive and all that kind of stuff, I don't think the music's dying, you know. I hear that term, oh, let's keep this music alive like it's on life support. You know, it's, <laughs> it's great music and it's always going to be around. Mm -hmm. And I think perhaps the mistake is trying to bring young people in because I don't think 20 year olds are going to want to hang out with a bunch of 60 and 70 year olds. It's just not going to happen, you know. Nobody's going to want to do that. But if you can bring in middle aged people, if you can bring in people that are more open, you know, 40s, 50s, 60s, you know, bring the age down younger, that's going to give this a longevity too and, 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 and build the community more rather than trying to 
skip all that generation aim for 20 year olds you know I think uh, get the middle-aged people involved you know because they're people with influence and a community and that's another good step too so that'll do okay so I've been uh, working in New Orleans for about six years most nights of the week and I'm just gonna check in with you guys and let you know what's going on down there because there's a lot of activity and there's a huge range of ages all from teenagers to you know 60 70 80 and everybody's getting together um there's i mean i especially lately in new orleans in the last like well for a long time the music's been passed down and it's um been very important to the culture and into the schools there in New Orleans and kids are exposed to music since they're you know babies and stuff but um, it seems that there's a hype and a whole pilgrimage of lots of people of all kinds of musical backgrounds from all over the world from all over the country pilgrimaging to New Orleans and uh, it's like the island of misfit toys there's all kinds of nerds and young people and all ages and shapes and sizes playing traditional jazz, New Orleans traditional jazz, swing, the gambit of um, early jazz. Um, so just living out there, talking about how this music is you know, dying off, it, it seems to me, being someone in their late 20s, like not, it, it doesn't register to me because I'm around it and I'm around people who all the time who are just like constantly nerding out recordings people in their early 30s and late 20s collecting 78s you know um so there's and and uh lots of friends in chicago and new york and there's great jams uh, there, uh we just started a jam in new orleans a traditional jam kind of modeled after mona's on tuesday nights we have it on wednesday nights super cool the place is packed with dancers and young people drinking, having a good time, playing the great songs that we all love. And um, it's, it's a really uh, vibrant scene down there. Um, and I think for a lot of people like me, going to the jazz camp and coming into this music and having mentors and um, idols and people who have been really gracious in showing me music and gracious in having me come up and play and, um, it's not a relic m music to me. It's not like I'm paying homage to it. It's my pop music. I don't think of it as old music. I think of it as the songs that I love and that I like to sing and that I like to play. And to me, music, synth music from the 80s seems more dated than this music, you know, it's... I just want to add something to what you said. New Orleans is unique because New Orleans, of course, is associated uh, the, as the birthplace of jazz. And one thing I've noticed about New Orleans, and, and I only was there for a short period of time, and I had to get out, I was turning into a bat. But anyway, mm -hmm. um, uh, but one thing about New Orleans is the music has always been cutting edge. If you, if you look back from, from the earliest days of jazz in New Orleans, and we go back to Alphonse Picou, and you go back to Buddy Bold and all that, there was always somebody coming along with a new take on it. And, and it's still happening today. I think New Orleans is a cutting edge for, for changes in jazz and, and, or, or music. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's one of the reasons why so many, uh, what we call traditional jazz musicians or people, I think that's why they migrate back to New Orleans because it's a climate that encourages all of this. Yes. And uh, I think you're right. I know you've, you've migrated there. Mm -hmm. Dave Ruckman has migrated back to there. Uh, I worked with, for years with many guys that, that you know grew up there and, and have come back. But I think Steve Yoakum has got yeah. his, He's got his uh, support payments done, so he can leave Holland and come back. <laughs> that was mean, but it, it was meant in good spirit. But anyway, um, but I think you're lucky because it's it's cutting edge. I mean, mm -hmm. if you start looking at, at the Neville brothers, and, and if you just even go back farther, it's, there's always somebody coming out of there with something new and different, and it's exciting. It is. It's an exciting climate. There's also a lot of ki uh, college graduates that have gone through more a contemporary jazz program or modern jazz program. And they come to New Orleans and they're like, I wanna make some money. So they, I'm gonna, I gotta learn these songs, I guess. And kind of begrudgingly, sorry, begrudgingly. 
go and learn the trad songs and then they end up really liking it and having a good time and being like what? and a lot of them just kind of you know still love doing both and you know mix the songs together and there's you know play some you know modern gigs but they also end up not all of them but a lot of them do end up really like enjoying the music and finding a lot of um uh information that helps them just musically all around um so that's kind of cool to see um and also being someone who went to the camp and i i go back every year and teach and work with the kids and um it's just so cool to see the kids and remembering that in me, like the first time I went to traditional jazz camp, I was 13 and I didn't want to go. <laughs> I wanted to go to like rock camp or something <laughs> like that. And um, so, and especially when I heard like, oh, it's old jazz. I was like, oh man, mom, why? Grandma, no, why? And then I heard, I heard them play for the first time and like you said, just a switch and I'm like oh my god this is what I want to do I love this so much and I, to be around that every year and see kids who are you know not really into it and then they hear um, you know the people uh, my age and then the professors and all of it all of us being friends and playing music it just like the switch goes off and now the camps expanded to two weeks it used, uh, used to be one week of youth camp, now it's two weeks of youth camp, so now we get the pleasure of seeing that happen twice in a year with all these kids, and it's, um, and then you're in the dorm rooms with the kids and they're singing, you know, the, they're singing, how come you do me, like, you know, do, 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 and songs like that, just as kids do at camp, at, at a summer camp, and it's just like, you know, your heart kind of smiles inside because it's really sweet and, um, there's a lot of kinship. It feels like a family. And uh, to me, uh, and I'll just finish with this, as far as generational and hanging out, there's, you know, we break down generations like millennial, Gen X, baby boomers. But I feel like there's a, uh, like a, the nerd and music generation crosses all ages and generations. Like when I hang out with my friends who are decades older than me, I don't think of them like that. We're nerding out about the same music. We love the same stuff. And um, it's really satisfying and wonderful to be around people who enjoy the same music as you. So that's my thoughts on that. I feel so much younger now. Launch off from there. I, I did want to say that, uh, you know, of course, New Orleans is, is like the, the national mecca for, for this music. Um, but then some other cities like New York also have great, you know, very strong scenes. and. Uh, yeah, strong and healthy scenes. And just to give you like a snapshot of New York, I did look up some stuff slash make back of the uh, envelope calculations. In New York, it's uh, estimated that there are over 50 venues that regularly, like, regularly present trad, jazz, or swing. And uh, most of those have it weekly or more often. Uh, I would say that there are at least two dozen bands that regular, regularly perform trad, jazz music. I don't know if you want to up that number. Um, there are about 20 weekly swing dance events, which often feature trad, jazz, but not necessarily all the time. And there are at least uh, a few jam sessions, which of course are, uh, are so useful in bringing, bringing new musicians into the fold and new audiences into the fold. And one of them such, uh, Mona's, has been going on for over a decade now. And it's, uh, it's been a really great thing. Like I met, I met some of the first uh, uh, trad musicians in New York City through that jam session, but, uh, but of course the question is like, what can we learn from these from these strong scenes in these cities? And one of the most important things I think we can take from New York is that it's is a scene is healthy and it's resilient because, uh, among other things, there's there's a large cooperation uh, between like closely related styles of music. Like even just now, I was saying trad jazz, but also swing. Um, but then, of course, in, in New York City, there's also a scene for like 1920s jazz and what uh, New York media loves to call hot jazz. Like we have our hot jazz uh, festival there. And then to a lesser extent, uh, you know, big band music and then, and then things that are, like I said, like another step away, like gypsy jazz, Western swing and such. But, but the fact that these uh, scenes work together means that there's a larger effective audience for all of the music, right? So we're not we're not only playing for for listeners at bars or restaurants, but also playing for swing dancers, for folks who are into uh, 
vintage fashion or folks who are obsessed about Gatsby or the Prohibition era. Or of course in New York we have some actual surviving speakeasies from, from that time. So there are people interested in that history and that gets them interested in the music. So, uh, so of course in the same way it's, it's great to see festivals and events that are also branching out into closely related music and, uh, and that's very important as well as partnering especially with, uh, with uh, a scene that's local to an event, whether that is like a local scene of, of swing dancers or again like a related, a related kind of music. Um, and then for, for of course uh, listeners and festival attendees, it, it really goes in this, in, in this same vein where it's important for us to, for you to come out not only to see you know, the five bands that you've been listening to for decades, but also taking a chance and hearing some bands from elsewhere, uh, you know, some newer bands with younger musicians, and then to support, support those bands that you wind up liking, not only through, uh, through your attendance and buying tickets, but also things like, uh, especially for young struggling musicians and older struggling musicians, like if you buy our recordings and tell your friends and, you know, all those, all those things help. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say is, of course, uh, uh, you know, I've been to a number of, of these festivals and, and arrived sometimes in a small town and just have talked, to, uh, have talked to locals and oftentimes I'll say, you know, I'm in town for this, uh, for such and such jazz festival and they'll never have heard of it. Like they'll have lived there for like 20 years, they've never heard of this festival. And of course that's a big missed opportunity, right? Like our first, one of the first things we can do to enlarge this audience is to just make sure the, the local community knows about it. And because there's a lot of people, um, frankly, who, you know, if they heard this music would probably really enjoy it. Because you, you like part of the reason we like this trad jazz is it's, it's so joyous and, uh, and accessible. So I mean, it's, I'm not a publicity expert, but you know, there are things, successful events I've, I've noted have done things like, of course, you, you want to do your traditional promotions in radio or print, but, but also consider things like having, a, having free outdoor concerts like in advance of your festival to promote it, and doing family-friendly things, so of course, so younger people can come out. Um, things like, uh, uh, you know, partner with libraries, your public parks, and there's just a lot that uh, can be done so we can help reach, you know, not just, so we're not just preaching to the choir and talking to people who already love this music because that's our that's our core of course but uh, but to spread the gospel you know it's it's important to do these other things well i'm i'm rhonda cardinal i'm the festival director and i have plenty to say here uh you know and i think i think we're an example of a reasonably successful um club so there's some great musicians up here, and some of them I've known for years and years. And I, th I think what the, the secret to success long term is to, is to make this music easier for the average musician to play. I mean, the people up here are great musicians, and they're going to succeed as musicians and play trad and do a great job no matter what. But. Um, what you really want to do, and this, this kind of ties into the getting that middle generation, the 40-year-olds is who we really need. Um, what you really want to do is make this music accessible for high school kids in band. You know, you got, you've got a lot of kids in band, and they're playing arranged band music. Uh, my daughter was one of them. I know everybody up here has played in band, just about. You know, you get your get you got your big high school band, and, and everybody gets their piece of music, and they know how to read, and they know how to play. Uh, what they don't know how to do is improvise or just kind of cut loose, and it's frightening because those of us, and I'm one of them, who are music readers, um, we're not we're kind of afraid of that whole soloing thing. Uh, so, and then there's another thing, which is. Uh, if you're in a big band like that, you don't really get to be in the spotlight too much. There's, you know, somewhere between 30 and 130 kids in a high school band. You don't really get that spotlight on yourself. And some people don't want that, but some people do. And so um, what we've tried to do, and it kind of comes in cycles, you know, you might get one kid from one high school band kind of interested 
in play in a jam session. We have jam sessions. We have a Sunday session every month, and we have a jam session kind of before we start our main event. And that used to be um, a couple of guys, maybe a woman. Uh, they all know the tunes. They don't need written music. They get up there, they play the tunes. So if you're a good musician or you're familiar with the repertoire, it's real easy for you to get up there and play. But those of us who are medium musicians who like to read music and we don't know how these songs go, we're, we're shut out of that. You know, we can't play that. So the best thing that ever happened to our club, and it's been almost 20 years, was Jim Borland put together kind of a, a lead sheet book. And it was maybe 20 trad songs. They were lead sheets, and he had them in all the keys that you need for like a little trad combo. And he distributed those. And so all of a sudden, the people who you know, can't really play by ear and don't even know the songs, all of a sudden, all these people had written music. And then somebody like me can now play in a jam set. And I may not do great solos. In fact, I've done pretty terrible solos. But at least I can read the music, and I know those songs. I know what those songs sound like. I know how to play them if I have the lead sheets. The kids don't know those songs. They don't know any of those songs. So now you got to teach them the songs. But they have written music, and so they can learn them. So it's kind of a multi-step process. You get one kid from one high school band that's kind of interested because they're a great musician, okay, these guys. And then um, you bring them into the jam set, and you encourage them to come, and you give them some lead sheets, and you let them play on stage in front of their parents and their grandparents and their friends of their parents. And the next thing you know, they're having a good time. Right, Molly? Yeah. They're having a good time. And they're like, hey, I'm having a good time. And also, everybody gets to see me play my trombone with my foot or whatever it is that I ever did on stage, you know? Everybody's looking at me. And so, hey, you, you friends of mine from the band, come on down because we got some music here and they're going to let us jam and then, you know, everybody's going to see us. Okay, so that attracts that middle level of musicians. And then that attracts their parents, and that's the parents that we want, because the parents are in their 30s, 40s, some of us 50s. We need those people, because you know how hard it is to throw a festival? It is like killer. It is killer. And, you know, some of our senior people, I'm not kidding, they're in their 90s, you know? So we need those 40, 50, 60 year olds to help us throw a festival. So, um, so that's kind of what's happened with us. We've We've, we've lowered the bar, brought in medium musicians, given them written music, had, had practice sessions at my house, teach them the repertoire, teach them those songs so that they can get up there and play and then bring them to the jam sessions and then bring all their parents. And now you're, you're building, to some extent, that middle generation that we really need. So rather than you know everybody should be a great musician and everybody should just know how to do it and everybody should just be able to play and you ought to be able to do this no just uh just bring them in and then send them to jazz camp and pay for them to go to jazz camp and when they hit jazz camp all of a sudden now they're getting um some real instruction and now this is how you do these solos and here's some music theory and this is how we do it and and then those guys learn it, and now they're the jazz ambassadors. They're out there, you know, bringing people in. So, I mean, that's what we've done. And right now we don't have a lot of young people, but we've had, because, you know, all our parents, like me, our kids have aged out. And Molly's mom, you know, there's no more young people. So we're waiting for the next, uh, I call them uh, gateway kids, you know, that, they, that you find somebody somewhere, and they bring in, like, all their friends and then we go through that whole cycle and they all graduate and go away now uh, you know the Hines Jackie and Brad Hines Jackie you probably bought your badges from Jackie Brad helped set up this festival I mean their kid is off in Florida now he's graduated uh, he's not playing with the jam session anymore he's not here but they're here okay they're they're here helping us run the festival so to me um, that's the secret is bring it to a level that the high school kids can come in and feel comfortable, teach them, you know, send them to camp, teach them how, how it's done. Some of them will come back maybe as adults and help us out. You never know, you know, some of these guys might help, you know, they're running festivals, helping us run festivals. 
That's what we need because it's not so much that the music is going to die out. It's more like the people that are running the festivals are just like really tired of it. And, and we need to get, we need that level of people to come in and help. Because if we don't, I can tell you, that's what's killing festivals. It's just the management of them. It's very, very difficult to do. So that is my speech. Uh, just to reiterate, you talking about um, the songs being passed down and accessible to everybody and of all kinds of musicianship just quickly i've always thought of this music and more and more as i play it and as i get older as less of the word jazz and more of american folk music yeah. i think it's about the songs and you know playing the tunes and sharing the tunes and sharing the chords and the melodies and the lyrics because it's it's a really cool thing that it's 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 our it's American folk music so and that folk music kind of means for everybody and it's accessible to all kinds of music musical levels and ages and so. Okay, I'm Paul Reed. If you've never met me before, uh, and there's quite a few things that I have not heard yet that are happening all over the world we you know this this jazz thing is an american art form that started here and spread all over the world and there are so many different interpretive uh, paths that are taken by musicians who started out reading music and learning the tunes but then it branches from there to okay what can i do with it how can i make that melody different well, the secret is that there are chord progressions, and you got to learn the harmony. And a lot of us, most of us successful ones, have done exactly that. I can I can go back book, chapter, and verse to when I got into to jazz, and it was God. Thank thank God, my grandparents had a, a good 78 RPM collection, and that's what started it. And um, but and then this goes back to the acoustical recordings, where um, there were improvisations going on on those things, and I thought, well, that's the key, and I wanted to do it, and it was very simplified for me when I learned, and it took a long, long time. And the further I went, the more I heard, the more I played uh, away from the melody, and the more I wanted to be involved with other players who were peers of mine for years and I'd never met that I started meeting and playing with. I mean, people like Teddy Buckner <laughs> and, and uh, oh, Probert, George Probert. Um, you just run into these people. I'm thinking a lot and I can't remember. <laughs> uh, but... It was like learning, oh, Montuti Garland, a great, great bass player. Um, and people in his category of life, uh, encouraging and giving support, like, you're on the right track, you're on the right path, keep doing this, don't give up, go out and integrate, you know, with other musicians. Well, you know, that's that's... That's what's uh, brought me to a lot of places to play, um, including Disneyland. <laughs> and, um, you know, sharing ideas mentally up here with other players that you're playing with, and it becomes a conversation between one, two, three, four, or how many other players are jamming on that particular session. And, um, that's where I said, aha, that's the big aha. Start learning how to say your, you know, express yourself musically and, and share, you know. And then all of a sudden, like I said, there are other musicians that start con conversing with you. Uh, I'll give you an example. Um, I was playing in a club, <laughs> very popular in Los Angeles in the 60s, called the Pink Pussycat which was a strip joint. And um, I was working with Herb Geller. And one night after we got done, he said, 
can you, would you answer me something? I said, yeah, what? He said, what do you do when you improvise? I said, well, I don't know, whatever comes out through my fingers. He said, would you try for me something if I, if I share it with you? He said, I said, sure. He said, think in your mind two bars ahead of what you're going to play. Now, when you feel comfortable with that, go to four bars. When you're comfortable with that, go to six bars, when, and then eight, and then 12, and then 16, 24, and 32 bars. Now you got a complete chorus in your mind, what you want to execute. And I got comfortable with that. And he said, but then go to the second chorus, 32 more bars, which is a, you know, like a chorus song. And um, it opened my ears, it opened my mind to how endless this thing of improvisation is and how important it is to jazz. Because that's, that's the heart of jazz. That's what, what jazz really is. And there are so many forms, not only trad, which we're talking about here, because trad has gone on you know, ever since the beginning of jazz. Uh, it's a matter of being able to express yourself by ear, not necessarily by reading. Reading is fine to learn the music, but the whole name of the game is when we do these jam sessions on the stage, is being able to use that in your mind to think, okay, what am I gonna play? How am I gonna express myself? How are we gonna, not just the melody, because that ain't jazz, nothing to it. Um, it's it's the, exp uh, the Benny Goodman, Artie Shaw, Tommy Dorsey, any person that's playing jazz, going back to the get-go, uses that system because it's the only system. That's the expression of jazz. That's what makes it work, folks. And uh, that's what has given me a whole lifetime of learning jazz. I went to my aunt and uncles at the age of three. They had an upright piano and I started one finger picking stuff out and they said, maybe he needs lessons, you know? And I, they had a heck of a time getting me not to play the melody. They said, stop playing by ear. The, you, gotta, you gotta learn the basics first and you'll get to it in time, and, and I did. And uh, in high school, in grade school, we had a jazz band, you know, and we had listened to the records and, and uh, shared, you know, what we had with each other. We had an appetite for jazz, you know, and that, that, that word has gone on and on and on throughout the world. We created it in this country and all over the world, people have migrated to our form of music. Jazz is music. And it's a very important part of music. Hi, I'm Jason Warner. 40-year-old um, poster child of the now defunct Sacramento Traditional Jazz Society. We're working on it. Um, I think something that's very important with all of this, and I, I think that a question that's on a lot of people's minds is what do we do? Like what do these festivals do to move forward? And first, before I get into the to the doom and gloom of it, um, I think, well, I, should, I think it's important to, uh, to say that right now um, there are probably more people under the age of 40 years old that are, for, for, that are playing this music than there ever have been. So we can start there. Um, I see it every year. Uh, more kids are getting more and more interested in this. Um, uh, lots and lots of really good points have been made. I think that uh, with, with respect to getting kids m even more involved, because we talk about reading music versus you know, improvising and making it up as we go, and we talk about music in the schools, we're talking about you know, music disappearing in schools so much. Um, one of the things I think is very important is because we don't see this so much in, 
in schools because uh, the, the main reason, I think, is because we have, there are a lot of music teachers that don't know what this is. They've never even heard of it. They've never heard of the, the, the collective improvisation. To them, jazz is having a, a, an 18 piece band all playing arrangements and everybody gets a chance to solo. So that's like, you don't see that in school. So I think one place we can start with all of this is to work on teachers, you know, and get teachers involved in these kinds of, uh, this kind of environment so that they can, you know, pass that along. If you get teachers involved, that's like, that's automatic. If they can start programs like that in their schools, that's automatic. Um, another, another thing I think that's very important, I mean, for all of us, um, like, I'm, I hate to admit it, but I'm, I'm 40 years old, and um, I know it's, I'm just as disappointed as you, but uh, the interesting thing uh, that is not being addressed I think, is that, because everybody's like, oh, we need to get more young people involved, get young people involved. Well, okay, when I was a kid, <laughs> I can't believe I'm actually saying that, but when I was a kid, there, were, there, there was no lack of kids that were interested in this music. And that may seem, that may come, to a big, uh, come as a big shock to all of you, but that's, that's, actually, um, that's actually true. Um, I went to the jazz camp when I was a kid, and there were, every year, there were, at the time it was smaller, but every year there were 40 of us. You know, I joined the TNT band in Sacramento, which I'm sure all of you have heard of. Um, I was in 1990, I was there for a year, and then I moved on, and all the guys that were in it were all graduated, and they moved on, and I moved on with them. But since then, there have been at least 20 different permutations of TNT. Um, so there's, you know, there are kids. Uh, one of the issues is because, I mean, for us, I don't think that anybody would disagree that for all of us musicians, we always had some musician who sort of um, took us on and mentored us or we spent a lot of time around musicians and they were always very, very good to us. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't say the same thing about the... Uh, jazz clubs, unfortunately. I hate to say that, but it's not, it, it didn't, they didn't foster that. I'm actually one of the lucky people that got through all of it. You know, there were at least, you know, I can, I could probably, if I went back in my head, I could, I could name probably 50 or more um, people that were my age or a little older, a little younger that were doing this music and then just quit and stopped. And the reason for that was because the, the, their success was not fostered. Mine was. I, like I said, I made it through. I actually got in through all of this. There, there was all of that. Um, and I'm one of the lucky ones. Uh, I think it's very important to address this because this is a mistake that was made years ago and I don't want to see that mistake being made again. Um, to be honest, when I was about 14 or 15 years old, I was one of the guys going, hey, 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 if you don't keep these kids playing like me, like I'm, I, I know you guys are being really great to me and I'm very grateful, but if you don't do that with everybody here, this is all gonna go away. Like all of these, these events that we have and the programs that we have in our respective jazz studies are going to start to disappear. Um, I could have told you that. Um, now, it's, everybody's kind of scrambling, like, what do we do now? What do we do now? And I think that that's important to recognize that um, we need to set this up for success in that sort of a way. Uh, one of the issues that happens is that what do you do when a kid turns 18? What happens after that? How can you support that? I mean, uh, you know, when I was with TNT, when that was going on, um, and it's still going on, but they, when students in TNT turn 18, they graduate from the band, and they get more people to go into to, to, to form a new band. It's the same thing. So it's this, it, you know, it's this feeder into a program that doesn't exist. So you have these kids who learn how to do this. There's plenty of them. There's so many kids that have come through this program. There's so many kids now that go to camp. That happens all the time. 
there are plenty of musicians there to mentor these kids. We're there. We're there. I see it every year. But where do they go? You know, where that's that's what we need to address is where do they go from that? Because some of these kids, and I hate to say it, some of these kids go on after they turn 18, they go on and they um, form a band. Believe it or not, they go on and they form their own band. And it may be made up of kids that are, uh, you know, that they played with when they were younger and they continue together. But darn it, do you ever see them at one of these events? No, you don't. You never do. They're there, they're wanting to play. They've, they, you know, they have to sit and bang on the door and bang on the door and bang on the door and say, you know, let, let us play. And, you know, we're adults now, so we want to get paid for this, as they should, because they've done the work. And, you know, jazz societies, they talk out of both sides of their mouth. They want to be, like, I, I can tell you, I'm a poster child. I am a poster child at 40. Um, and that's what I gave to them, but I had to work so hard to get to move forward and get paid. The only way that I could really do it effectively was to join up with a band that was already established, that was already doing this. Um, I couldn't put my own band together and do that. I did it one time, um, but I had to go through so much to get, to, to get through to everyone. Um, and I'm still giving, I'm still like the guy that the, these kids go to for advice on how to do that, because they're still having that trouble. Um, so yes, we are fostering the kids, and I think that's fantastic. There's so many of them playing, but the opportunity seems to just not, it seems to fizzle out, and what we need to do is really spend a lot more time on that, um, because that was a mistake that was made, because what happens is, and I've seen it for years, that these kids, they turn 18, they try to keep it together, the opportunities disappear, and then they either quit or move on to something else. And then this environment that we love so much suffers. Um, and it's, it's just because of mistakes that get made like that. So um, I hate to be that guy, but uh, it's, and, and I don't wanna sound like it's, it's completely pessimistic because it's not. There's a lot of optimism. Like I said, there's so many kids playing this music and I think it's fantastic that and we're all doing our part and we're doing as much as we can to do that. But you know, if you really wanna do, do this, if you really wanna continue these kinds of events, I think that that's an important uh, thing to, that needs to be addressed. So. Okay. You got a quick comment here, Bob? Yeah, I, I agree wholeheartedly with your concept, too. It, 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 if you're going to start with a youth program, uh, you could do lip service. You, you really want to make it work. If you want to make it work, they have to have a place to play. And what occurred to me is that why, like, for example, where I live, we have a Veterans Administration, and those guys are starving for entertainment. If you take a youth band in there and you play the, this music that we love, if you play this music, you'll be astounded how many guys respond to that. And it's more, the important thing is the kids are performing, they're playing and, and honing their craft, and they've got an audience that appreciates it. You can do that at a moose lodge, you can do it at an elk's lodge, you can do it if you're, and there's members here, I'm sure, who are, a lot of members here, Amer uh, members of the American Legion or in VFWs, uh, they're always looking for something exciting and fun for their membership. And, uh, and if, you, if the jazz club has to fork out 25 bucks a pop or whatever it is that, to give the kids a little, bit of a, a little bit of cash just to get them to go out and show up and play and, and, and offset the expense of mom and dad getting them there or whatever, that's, that's a well spent money. And it also justifies your 501c3. The tax exempt status is based on, uh, usually on uh, what we are doing to promote this art form. And that, that fits right into that, that exact 501c3 requirement. So I would suggest that, that uh, Jason is absolutely right. If, if, you want it to, if you want it to work, you want kids to play. And if the kids play, mom and dad show up. So right. Uh, the other thing that, that, here's an example of what I kind of, uh, this was, about, was my experience when I was going through Sacramento and their big jubilee. I mean, they had the biggest, the biggest one ever, right? Um, it was really interesting to me because there were enough youth bands, there were enough of us that they actually had separate sites for us. There were like six or seven separate sites, you know, all operating all day long. 
you know, so that's, you know, seven bands at any given point during the day all per performing. Um, multiple times, no, they're at, in Old Town, at the festival, um, in, you know, seven sites all day of all youth bands. Well, um, I'm very grateful for that because there were a bunch of us who were all able to play and that was fantastic. And the best part about all of that was they used that for promotion because those sites were free for people to go into. Um, now that I understand a little bit more about how all of it works, I see the, this idea they wanted, in a way, they also wanted to keep us segregated from everyone else. And that's the other part of it, because I was in a band that I know was trying to knock on the door to move up and not be a youth band anymore, and that we, we were up against pretty much impossible odds and it was just it was literally because they wanted they didn't want to pay us and they didn't want to keep us they wanted to keep us there um we even made the case because when we would play our sets three quarters of the audience were badge holders and they were coming to see us and even still still didn't have any luck trying to move forward um that whole entire scene started to dwindle um, the number of youth bands actually went down for a while. It's going back up, but it went down. Um, and the number of sites went down. The interesting thing to me was that they were paying enough money to have all of these seven sites to keep us away from everything else, but they didn't want to pay us. They could have just integrated us into the yeah, rest of the whole festival and just paid us and saved a lot of money, but they didn't want to. Have to it was very important for them to not to do that. Yeah, to move on. Sure. Um. Oh, I'm going to address it in a little bit different manner. Uh, I agree with, with Jason. I would like to see bands that, um, we have bands that are either old farts or kids. And I'd like to see a, a better balance of, of, of the band's uh, hiring. Uh, but you know, that's, that's up to the band managers and the leaders of the bands to do this. And they do, they're not, hiring the younger people as they should. And what, what you get is you get, get a lot of people who want to see one certain type of music and they won't, they won't go to, they won't, they, no, this is too loud, I don't like this, or it's, it's different. And I've, I've, uh, I'm going to address this more as a, as a listener. Um, when I, when I want to go in and listen to a band, um, I, ask, I ask other people, um, do you like jazz? And they say, I don't like jazz. I said, well, do you understand what jazz is? And they say, well, you know, it's not that, that noise. And I said, well, do you like swing? Yeah. Well, do you like Latin music? Yeah. Well, do you like big band music? Yeah. Well, then you like jazz. And I think one of the things that the festivals have to do is educate the audience. You've all been talking about educating the musicians, but nobody's talking about educating the audience. And some of the best uh, festivals I've been to are actually, and on a recent cruise, Tom Hook did a two-part um, history, uh, the history of jazz, just to teach people, the listeners. And I think that in order to keep our festivals going, and you're, you've, got, you've got the musicians here. What you don't have is the people out there listening. And you've got to educate the audience to, to what you're doing and, and what you have here. And that's it. Yeah, I'd like to go back to one of Jason's comments. He said we need to educate the teachers. And so that is something that we have done at Pismo is from January through June, we bring in the high school jazz bands. Now, they're not playing trad jazz. They're playing whatever they're playing. And some of them are good, and some of them are great, and some of them aren't that good. But we, we bring them in um, at the point in time during the school year, the teachers think they're at their prime. We, we tell them to have their kids come early and play in the jam session because most of those kids have never done that before. And then, um, you know, they have written music. And then the, these school bands and the teachers can see what we're doing and they know who we are so that when we send out emails and tell them about jazz camp or we try to hook their kids in, um, they've seen us because otherwise they will never see us because they have no idea who we are. 
So we do reach out to the high school and junior high, and you'll see Tevis actually was playing this morning. And then some of those kids go to jazz camp. So that is our outreach program, is to bring uh, the high school, college, junior high bands to our club to be the intermission band and play for us, and then invite their kids to come early and play in the jam sessions. Um, okay, so I think we're pretty much out of time, but um, this has been recorded. I want to thank all the panelists for coming up. Um, what I'll try and do is put in our newsletter some summary of it.